All right, this is another uh, Riddick scenario. Remember a few years ago when Riddick came out by itself? So I was like, let's just do the trilogy. And what do we have to lose besides our own will to live? Um, <laughs> and this won't be the last time this year that you do this either. Yeah, so Underworld Blood Wars technically came out by itself as far as movies of the new year ago. Right. Um, so I thought it would be... Uh, Fences is one thing, because it's an awards contender, and good. Yes. And, you know, Underworld getting its own video, it would have seemed just like a... I don't know. So it was like, let's just do the whole series. <laughs> just why not? <laughs> you gave me this idea, and I was like, are you crazy? And you'll notice, it, uh, if, you, if you like this format, uh, yeah, you might remember that at the end of the month, uh, we're getting another Resident Evil movie, too. So I'm saying fucking doing that as well. So Resident Evil, the whole series of Resident Evil will get its own video, and then the rest of the movies that week will be in another. But in the meantime, uh, let's celebrate the arrival of a fifth Underworld movie by starting from the very beginning. Okay. Well... Yes, naturally. We, we're going the Fast and Furious route. The third one's the one that's out of order, but the beginning of the movies. Uh, and yeah, there's going to be, um, since they've been out for a while, and if you're watching this, you've probably seen them, um, from this one through to Awakening, we're going to go into spoilers, but I won't, since it's brand new, I won't go into spoilers for Blood Wars, so, just so that's out there. Okay. Um... So, obviously, uh, we begin, and it's another one of those kind of in-its-own-world things. They have their own terminology, and their own setup, and their story going on, and all that. Where it's the the vampires and the lichens doing battle. Lichens, because you can't just say werewolves, because that would be too simple. <laughs> um, and... Obviously, Celine, the very sexy leather clad Kate Beckinsale, is a death dealer whose job it is to basically kill lichens. Uh, she's like a lichen assassin. So, and her, because kind of things are dying down, uh, the death dealers are going to become obsolete soon enough. <laughs> So, and we get kind of a sense, like, it, this is one of those cases where we start off and we get the story in the background, you're like, well, great, it's one of those movies. And <laughs> it's just, that narr it's, if it's not scrolling, if it's not scrolling text, it's very boring narration to give us a backstory. Um, but for the, but the thing that's okay, I guess, about this exposition given to us by Celine through narration is that it kind of gives us a bit of an intro to her as a character as well. Um... Because the whole introduction when she's talking about the fact that death dealers are going to be obsolete soon. Um, she has that line where it's like, which is a shame because I live for this. And then she just fucks a whole bunch of them up. Um, and not to mention she's got a liking grudge because they, you know, killed her family. Supposedly. Um, and this is obviously brought to us by um, Kate Beckinsale's future husband as well as future ex-husband as of last year. <laughs> Len Wiseman. Um, who is a pretty decent director he went on to show. I think this was his first movie movie. He was originally a production designer on uh, a lot of things, but I think mainly, I believe he was a production designer on Independence Day. Um, and then he got this job, and then he did like a couple more of these. This is one of those series where the director shifts every now and then. But then he went on to do like Live Free or Die Hard and the Total Recall remake. Um, so he's, even if the movies aren't necessarily, you know... Greater fan. Live Free or Die Hard is a really good sequel to the Die Hard movies, and he's he did really good with that, especially considering all the drama that supposedly went on. And um, as I said before, um, I'm fine with the Total Recall remake as long as you completely disregard it's a remake of Total Recall. Um, so I've got nothing against him, and he has a very. It's clear he had an eye when he made these movies. This very soon to be signature, like black and blue look. That these have, where like if that that's typically an issue where everything's in the damn dark, <laughs> so you can't see anything. But um, here it's kind of I'm trying to think if there was anything before it, but it kind of feel like it kind of established something in this genre 
and kind of gave it this look that would be copied a lot. Like, I'm, I'm sure of this, I'm sure of this more than copy something. It very much feels like, uh, while this feels like the start of something, at the same time it also kind of feels like a bastard child of Blade or something. So, uh, not even Blade 2, just like the first one. Hmm. So, <laughs> guess because we know Stephen Norrington is no Guillermo del Toro by any means whatsoever. Must not even bring Goyer's ass into this. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, but, I mean, sometimes, you know, there is that annoying exposition thing, where there is a lot to establish. Like, the, like we have the opening narration, which is fine, because we, even if you don't like exposition, we do need to know the story. We do need to know what's going on. Um, but then there's cases, like, when she's about to wake up Victor from hibernation, uh, and suddenly her, ex her expository narration comes back, like, 45 minutes into the movie. So, well, this, this just feels misplaced. Um, but then there are cases where and you, you've got to find a balance. I know it sounds like I'm kind of have combating opinions here, but the point is that you need to find a balance because in one case I'm saying that I'm usually very anti exposition and there's, you can only explain so much for so long before it becomes tedious and boring. Uh, but then there's cases where maybe we could use at least a little bit of... <laughs> at least throw us some clues or something. Because we have all this exposition that tells us about the war and Selene and what her job is and how... What motivates her. Then immediately following that, we have this scene where a dude is being... This is our Scott Speedman introduction. You know, actors, actors, Scott Speedman. <laughs> Who's gonna be with us for at least a couple of movies. Great. To the point that he gets the second credit right next to Beckinsale. That's how much Scott Speedman's involved in this. Great. So, um... So he's being followed. And this is the thing, is... This scene almost feels like it's right for parody. Because it's like, he's being... We see that he's being followed. And then it seems like the person following him is being followed. And it's like this endless chain of faces we've never seen before. With no context whatsoever following each other until some big action scene breaks out and while this is all going down and people are like vaporizing and getting shot and being blown to pieces or being ripped apart or whatever you're just like who the fuck are all of these people and why was this person following this person while that person was following that and it's just it's just a clusterfuck and then it's that point where you're like can we bring at least a little bit of the exposition back because i'd like to know what the fuck this is <laughs> like i know there's a war i know that but that's not really giving me... That's still quite vague in regards to what's going on in this scene. And then Michael Sheen shows up. The, <laughs> Michael Sheen, where he's... When he's not, you know, doing, you know, prestige projects like The Queen or Frost Nixon, he loves this vampire versus werewolf stuff, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he does. Because <laughs> um, obviously he's on the werewolf side here, and then we know in future movies, a few, a certain other series that people love so much, he's gonna be on the vampire side. <laughs> he just likes to play both sides. That's what he wanted to do. He just wanted to cover both things. Um, plus, he knew he'd get his own movie if he waited long enough, even though he dies in this one. <laughs> so, um, and for a lot of the movie, it's played up that uh, Michael Sheen is our villain. Um, and we learn, we learn that there was this Lycan warrior Lucian who died, who was supposedly dead and all that. And it's a good maybe half an hour into the movie before we realize that's who the fuck Michael Sheen is. And it's like, well, no, he's not dead at all. And then we just have to roll with that from then on. <laughs> just for him to straight up die again. <laughs> In the most bitch of ways. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um... But, yes, um, if there's one thing in this movie I don't particularly care for, it's this whole idea that Selene has to protect Michael, I think is his name. It's fucking Scott Speedman, who's, who I'm clearly a fan of. <laughs> yes, clearly. Um, you know, to be totally and completely honest, this movie's probably why I haven't liked him as an actor yet. Because he was, he was like Kurt Russell's partner in Dark Blue, which I thought was shitty. Um, there was, like, The Captive with Ryan Reynolds. Like, every movie I see him and I hate. And I'm gonna blame it on him. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure there's something I'm forgetting, but I'll remember later, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, it's one of those cases where she has to protect him, but then... 
the vampires turn on her because he's a lycan, but he's also like a hybrid thing. And then like his ancestry, all that stuff. All that stuff that the sequels are going to kind of toy with anyway, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, and yes, um, it would be one thing if he was just a character in this movie, but no. We absolutely, positively could not get through this movie whatsoever without doing the instant attraction thing. Where one minute they're running, one minute they're in a car chase... The next minute they're fucking kissing for no reason other than the fact that the sequel wanted to have an awkward sex scene but we'll get to that later um maybe more awkward than the neo trinity sex scene in the matrix reloaded i don't know it's a tough call um though i do, I do kind of like the way they play on that at least a, once they play on it once very briefly when she's like you know well you're a werewolf so you're gonna fuck people up if you turn it on, so I'm gonna have to keep you in one place. So they do the thing where it's like this passionate kiss thing. It's like the post-action scene kiss. And just when we think it's gonna go into something, it's been a distraction just to strap him in place. It's like that's I like if they threw it in there for that. But the fact that it expands and it really is the instant attraction plot. Wonderful. I'm sure that's really gonna add something to the proceedings. I'm sure Scott Speedman won't disappear halfway through the franchise, and then the last couple of movies have to he has to be played by a double whose face we never see. I'm sure that'll be really important down the road. Do you know why Scott Speedman just disappeared? Because studios started looking at his acting thoroughly and was like, yeah, <laughs> we've been making a mistake the past decade or so. Oh, <laughs> Let's just, you know, even for an Underworld movie, it's like, you know what? Let's just hide his face and make him not a character anymore. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, Effects-wise, yeah, we're still in, what was this, 2002, 2003, somewhere in there. Um, where special effects were still in kind of a transition phase. We were in Lord of the Rings territory, but Lord of the Rings was like that, that unreachable place that all movies were t still very much under. Um, and there's, there's still some cool stuff. Like, uh, like when Michael Sheen can squeeze the bullets out of him, even though once again, throughout the series, they play that out so much it's not cool after a while. It's like, it's just, you know, second, whatever. Um... And that's second nature, that's what I was looking for. Um, and the idea of, like, uh, the silver nitrate bullets is kind of cool. Um, but then, there, and you know how, like, it goes into the bloodstream and that's how they die and shit. Um, it, it, like, even, even though, yes, Lucian still does go out like a bitch, regardless of how cool those bullets might be. And that is because one of our villains, we have, we have Lucian, we have Victor, but there's another villain in this movie. <laughs> The, another villain that is the bane of my existence. <laughs> That's right, I'm talking about Craven. Fuck Craven. <laughs> um, Craven would be an okay villain if it weren't for the fact that the guy playing him is probably one of the worst actors I've ever seen in my life. And that may have something to do with the fact that I can't think of another movie off the top of my head that he's in besides this and the sequel. <laughs> um, and... Yes, uh, and, that, and that's the thing, too. Like, this guy's acting kind of brings out the, what, uh, this other point. Um, when this, when I first saw this, I didn't see it in theaters, but when Blockbuster got it, I sought it out because my brother and his friends were into it, kind of. Um, I was talking to my brother the other day, he didn't even know Blood Wars existed. Let alone that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Let alone that it's already out. <laughs> Um, so I watched it and I, I just really hated it. Like on site, I just kind of really didn't like it. It was, it felt like one of those movies that was, and I was its fan base at the time. I would have been like 13, <laughs> a 13 year old boy, mind you. I was their fan base. I was their target demographic. Um, and I just was watching it was like, this is trying way too hard to be cool. Like, this really wants to be... So they're they're trying. They're clearly trying with some Trinity look by dressing her completely in leather and having the coat that makes noise just by flapping in the wind and shit. I mean, not, I mean she does kind of sell the coolness, like, when she drops and is just able to walk away from it. But that's just Kate Beckinsale's general sexiness, I think. Uh, not necessarily the character herself or the direction. Um, 
but yeah, like stuff like that, like having a sexy, you know, female hero, it's kind of like, yeah, teenage boys will probably drool over watching her, you know, flip around and fire guns and bullshit. Um, killing, you know, vampires and werewolves and shit. Um, there is the, uh, the soundtrack, the rock, the very early 2000s rock soundtrack with like that guy, like that general oh, screaming voice, you know, that's all over the soundtrack. <laughs> You know, like the Queen of the Dam soundtrack. No oh god. Like personified all soundtracks of this genre in the early two thousands. <laughs> um, and then there is um, there's the car she drives around in, um, that's really fast and really loud, so that during car chases, most of the time it's an interior shot with them talking dialogue while they're being chased or chasing someone but every single time she makes a turn it has to be an exterior shot so we can hear how loud the car rooms it's one of those things <laughs> it's like i'm sure teenage boys just eat this right up but <laughs> um and then there's also kind of uh obviously eventually with twilight and the like um Vampires also became a teenage girl craze as well. It's like this movie was kind of trying to combine them. So it's like when you look at Craven, for instance, and you see his long hair, his pale skin, his chiseled face, and his bad acting. It's like, yeah, this, <laughs> this is the teenage girl aspect of it. Fuck you, Craven. So, um... And then, and, yeah, it's like... It's the and it's not just it's not just Craven. It's a lot of the side. I mean, you have some really good actors in here, like fucking Michael Sheen. Victor is Bill Nye. It's it's very not. It's like no, they weren't in Love Actually, but they were in this. <laughs> it's like, um, it's the way, obviously you know it makes it sound like Bill Nye wasn't. Of course, Bill Nye was in Love Actually. He won a fucking BAFTA for it. But as far as a British cast, yeah, this okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, now anyway, um, it's certainly not the Potter cast, we will say that. Uh, except, for, I think he popped up in at least one, didn't he? <laughs> anyway, I'm getting off track here, sorry. Um, and, but yes, another thing I wanted to point out was obviously that the look of it is very appealing. Even though it's kind of associated itself with bad movies. Because, like, like I said, there may have been something before this that kind of set it up, but I feel like this really set it up for... This very familiar aesthetic being in movies like uh, I, Frankenstein, or Van Helsing. Remember when the first trailer for Van Helsing came out and everybody assumed it was another Underworld movie? Because they saw Kate Beckinsale in that kind of world. <laughs> That's you, a good point. Like, I think, for real, until Hugh Jackman showed up, it was like, I'm pretty sure this is another Underworld movie, but I'm not positive. Um, so, yes. Um, however, I will say... Obviously, I have watched it since that first time, and while it's still Underworld, <laughs> nothing has changed. Um, it's not near as bad as I remembered, um, and yeah, there there is some stuff that is, you know, that is, yeah, there... <laughs> it's, not, it's not near as bad as I remembered. Another thing that is really playing in its favor... It's surprisingly really fast-paced. Because there are movies... Like, Van, going back to Van Helsing, for instance. If there's one... I, I'm not a fan of Van Helsing at all. And you know why I'm not a fan of Van Helsing? It is so goddamn boring. And so long. It's like two and a half hours. And a lot of it is just bullshit. Um, this movie is two hours. It's two hours and one minute. Which is pretty long for a Vampires vs. Werewolf movie. Yeah. But um, it moves really quickly. Like, it's kind of... Say what you will about the movie. It it manages to push past bullshit and really kind of go right into the stuff that people came here to see. And it is that pretty much throughout the whole thing. It's just every now and then you have to stop and explain shit. But to the movie's credit, you kind of won't know what's going on. Like that opening scene at the train station, for instance. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's not as bad as I remembered. I'm a little pissed off. I do really like the character of Lucian, and I do understand. It seems totally pointless in the long run, but it does make me a little happy that if they chose to give one of the characters in this movie his own movie down the line, I'm glad it was him. <laughs> and I think they realized that because um, it's such a shame how much of a bitch he goes out in this movie. It's like 
This guy has lived for all these years. He was thought dead, but now he's back and he's hardcore. He's ripping people apart. We know, obviously down the line, he's, he's big enough to get his own movie later. How does he go out? He gets shot in the back by Craven. <laughs> Look that what a you. bullshit way to go out! I mean, he he get he has enough to go. It's like Robbie Coltrane in the world is not enough, where it's like he's the villain through the whole movie, but then he comes back just long enough to like, hey, I've got some good in me, Dad. Um, so he gets shot in all places by Craven. Still, it's like so it's like Craven shoots him in the back, and you're like, oh shit, what a bitch! And then he gets up, and you're like, yeah, Craven's not gonna take your ass out. You're better than this, Lucian. And then of course. He still dies, still by Craven's hand. <laughs> but, you know, it's fun. And the, the battle at the end with Victor is cool. The slicing his head in half thing. You know how you know it's cool? Because they show it in every single movie that comes out after this one. It's, it's the prologue to every single movie is showing that fight again. Um... But yeah, it, it's it's a lot better than I remember, and I do I do get the appeal certainly, and that the fact that it spawned a franchise because it started, obviously it ends on a cliffhanger that we go right into in a second. Um, before I go, it is worth noting before Underworld goes, it's worth noting. Um, I hope you're not too mistaken by the end credits. Um, maybe you probably didn't notice it in two thousand two or two thousand three or whenever this came out, but um. You'll notice probably now if you watch it again, the screenwriter is a guy named Danny McBride. I'm sorry, it's not the same one. I know how I know how badly you want that to be true, but I'm sorry, it's not the same Danny McBride. <laughs> um, but you all can dream if you want to. We can pretend. It wouldn't surprise me if the Danny McBride we know wrote this, honestly. Even though he's more well known for, uh, he got his start with making David Gordon Green movies. But yeah, it really wouldn't surprise me. So, we can pretend, can't we? Okay, remember all that stuff I was talking about? About how Underworld... I watched Underworld again, I used to hate it, and it's not near as bad as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And there's actually some pretty cool stuff in it. And maybe I misjudged it at the start. Maybe I was way too harsh on it. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, and Underworld Evolution, on the other hand... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um... I actually remember, it's kind of a reverse thing, I actually remember not hating this one too much, especially in comparison to the first one, when it initially came out, um, but, you know, shit happens. Uh, and the thing is, is that, I almost lost it, the thing is that, remember how I was talking about how at least we didn't start with the scrolling text in the first movie? Right. Well, guess what Under Ever Underworld Evolution does, can't even say its title. Guess how Underworld Evolution starts. Yep, it's the goddamn scrolling text. Um, and the thing about that also is, it's it's kind of like, um, you remember at the start of all the Friday the 13th movies, at least through part three, three or four, where they play like the entire last 20 minutes of the movie prior to it uh, to, as a recap, but it's really just to kind of, you know, drag out the runtime a little bit. Um, that's kind of what the Underworld movies feel like. Not to that extreme, but they feel the need to show us everything that happened in the movies prior beforehand, as if we didn't know them. And I, that wouldn't be so bothersome, because, yeah, some people need caught up, because maybe they hadn't just seen the first one when they go into the second one, and so on. Um, but then we get to cases, like, when, um... There is like he's got the bodies. The bodies of Lucian and Victor are in that I don't I don't really remember now. They're laying there. I can't remember if it was a morgue or what it was, but that's how memorable this movie is. Um and he looks at their bodies and obviously Michael Sheen's not really there. Um Bill and I is in this movie, but he's not gonna play the half decapitated corpse of Victor, so it's clearly a dummy or a placement or whatever. But even so, we know these are the bodies of Lucian and Victor, yeah? Just by looking at them, we can tell. Their looks are unmistakable. They were extremely major characters in the other movies. But sure enough, just to make sure we fully and completely remember, we gotta see those scenes again, flashes of them real quick when we see these corpses. 
Because it's as if we will... The movie really believes we have no idea what's going on enough to where we don't remember the very major villains in the first movie by sight. So, thank you for doing the whole flashing shit at us thing. What were we... I don't remember what I was talking I was talking about something relatively recently where when things flash frenetically on the screen to show you shit really fast, whether it's showing you like a premonition or something that already happened or showing you something from a previous movie to make sure you remember it, I don't think I've ever seen that happen in a good movie. <laughs> I mean, can you think of one off the top of your head? Not off the top of my head. Okay. So, um, I feel like that, it seems like a small thing. I feel like it speaks volumes. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, we continue. Obviously, Craven is still alive because he shot Lucian and ran away. And then it's like, well, great. We got to put up with Craven for another movie. And so he's like, I'm going to go. Who is it? Is it Marcus? Was the name of the villain in this one? Yep. Um, so he's like, I'm going to go wake up Marcus and we're going to wreak havoc. And then he goes and he wakes up Marcus. Marcus wakes up, brings his shit together, and smashes Craven's head into a billion pieces. And it's like, well, number one, I don't know whether to be overjoyed or pissed off. Because I'm overjoyed because Craven died horrifically just as soon as he entered the movie. So we rarely had to put up with him. But then I could be pissed off because it was like, you know... If this was going to happen so fast, you could have done this at the end of the first movie. I mean, I know Mar Marcus is going to wake up regardless. We didn't have to have Craven there. <laughs> we seriously could have killed him in the first movie. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever you want to do. I think he even gets like a major credit in this. But he's in it for like 30 seconds before he dies. <laughs> Maybe that's a tease or something. Or a trick to kind of surprise people that he dies so quickly. Congratulations, you tried to make Marion Crane out of Craven. <laughs> but, alas, we can put Craven to rest forever now. <laughs> um, so, instant points for that. Um, however, yes, um, there's a lot of problems in Underworld Evolution. The movie you can't see whatsoever because of the glare. There it is. Um, the start is that you can tell that they are going by the sequel rule. Which is, if you're going to make a sequel, especially to a movie like this, um, you're going to have to go bigger. Uh, you're going to have to expand and all that stuff. And they do follow that. Um, the action is bigger. It's bloodier. Um, but, and, and, and yeah, so now that they've done that... Uh, they forgot to make the action scenes relatively interesting. <laughs> and yeah, even even Marcus, because, you know, there, there's Victor and Lucian and Craven and all that, um, who were good, the first two were good villains, um, and they were just who they were. You know, Victor is just a vampire, and Lucian is just a lycan. Marcus is this big fucking thing uh, that can morph into this whole... He's he's like a gargoyle he will come to life and can fuck your shit up. Um, but going bigger in every aspect, um, they also made them more boring. And there's... <laughs> and there's just... Ev everything... Everything, regardless of going bigger, also feels lesser at the same time. Um, and that's... I, I, I don't know. It's just, it seems like they felt like they were going, I can understand if they felt like they were going in the right direction, um, but just so much falls flat in so little time. Um, they're also trying to squeeze in a lot here, too. Um, up to and including... It's really, it's really... Uh, I, I know I just spent a lot of time on this, but... Obviously, we have to expand on the Scott Spiefel thing. <laughs> So, obviously, since we were so terribly denied in the first movie, this one absolutely had to have a sex scene. And you will learn later, you will learn in the next movie even, that sex scenes? Not the strong suit of these movies. <laughs> if you can believe that. Um, so, 
Yeah, it's basically, it might as well be a PG-13 sex scene, just with a little more skin than you're used to. Even though I'm pretty sure for the first half of it, he's humping her stomach. <laughs> That's the, the room? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and it's in there, and it's just in there. Has no, well, okay. It, I guess it has bearing on something in Awakening, but that's hardly... We've still got a whole other movie to go through. I know the timeline matches, because this goes right into Awakening. They're only six months apart before shit goes down in Awakening. Um, so, okay, fine. Plot-wise, it has a purpose. But at the same time, it's one of those things where... It is so incredibly rare. A movie, especially in this genre, has a sex scene that just doesn't feel like filler, or doesn't feel like it's trying to elicit a certain reaction, then it's completely and totally important to everything else at hand. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess whoever you are, it depends. Um, but once again, much like, even more, I said this about the first movie, much more apparent in this one, it feels like a very low-rate boy movie. Like, it feels like... You know how we were just kind of, like, there was Blade, which is fine, of course, and then Blade 2, where Del Toro just really took it into a great place and made a Blade movie into something incredible, and then Goyer made Trinity, and Blade sucked. Like, that was, that was it for the series. Blade suddenly sucked now. Um, if they had gone on and made a fourth one, it would probably look something like this. <laughs> At the rate they were going. I don't think we were going to have a balance up like Del Toro again. I'm pretty sure Blade Trinity put, in a pla put us in a place where the only place to go was down, and that's why they didn't continue, movie-wise. This is kind of half a Blade review, I guess, too. Um, and, yes, now, this is 15 minutes shorter than the first movie as well. Um, and it feels so much slower. This does not move nearly as fast, and it feels like it takes fucking forever. Um, and weirdly enough, this is the only movie in the series that does that. Like, whether the movies get better or worse, um, this is the only Underworld movie that feels really, really long. Blood Wars kind of did, after a while, given how short it actually was. But for the most part, this is kind of the one Underworld movie where everything just feels really slow and pointless and drawn out. And all that. Well, we'll get more into the drawn out aspect, but I mean as far as just how long it feels like you're watching it when it's under two hours. Um, that's always an incredibly bad sign. Um, the action isn't necessary. well, I say the action's more boring even though it tries to go bigger. Every now and then it has its moments, but for the most part, yeah, it's just... Everything, it, you could tell very much it was trying to take everything a step up, but everything took at least one step down. Uh, I can't think of anything this movie improved on with the first one, uh, despite all those attempts to go bigger, so... We can appreciate the effort, I suppose. I mean, they could have just acted like they weren't trying at all, which a lot of movies would probably do. Um... But yeah, this does not feel like... This does not feel like the second entry in a series. This feels like about the fifth or sixth. If you didn't have any context. Um, so, they were like, well... Okay. Um, that kind of blew. So, what do we do now? I've got it. Uh, we'll take the characters that everybody liked in the first movie that we killed off... And give them their own movie. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll win some hearts back over if we do that. Uh, so that's what they did. Uh, you remember a whole segment in the first movie when, um, it's when they're basically trying to make, give Lucian that transition of, well, well, he's gonna be a good guy now, or at least the best he can be. Um, and he had to watch, you know his lover, who was a vampire, um, get, die by the hand of her own father, who we know to be Victor. Um, because the Lycans were slaves at the time, and it's a whole kind of forbidden love story. It's almost like, it's almost like Underworld tried to go Shakespearean or something when they made this movie. 
Um, and when they kind of set up that story in the first movie. And so, even though we know exactly how it plays out, and we even got to see glimpses of it, um, they're like, well, we've got an, hour, we've got an hour and a half to spare. Let's go ahead and make this into another movie. Like a full-length one of everything we already know because of one scene in the first movie. <laughs> I see where it's a good idea, and I see where it's a bad idea. So it really just depends on the person where you stand um, with this movie. Whether or not you feel, yeah, this was a good direction to go, especially after the downfall that was evolution. Or you can say, why? I know how this ends. I, <laughs> I know, not only do I know how this ends, I know what happens all the way up to that point. Um, but let's just see what it has in store. Maybe it'll be some visual stuff, maybe some good action scenes. Yeah. <laughs> No, neither. Just kind of right in the middle here, more or less. Um, I will say, it's, um, when you watch these movies, or when you know about them, I don't know if you saw the first two. I know we saw this one. Mm -hmm. With old, what's her name? Um, but the thing is, is that, does Victor, Bill Nye's character, mm -hmm. he's like Jigsaw. It's like... <laughs> He's in, like, every movie in the series for the first three when he dies in the first one. <laughs> Remember, they killed Jigsaw in Saw 3, but he's in the whole damn series all the way to 7. Um, they just really like working with Bill and I. That's it. <laughs> that, that's believable. Um, so we'll, we'll say that's how this... That's, we'll say that's why this movie exists. They really, really love working with him and Michael Sheen. Um, so... I, okay, um, basically what it does feel like, it's not a bad movie, but the first thing you kind of think of is, well, when we got to Evolution, they were clearly running out of steam, and they were kind of throwing in new plot points to kind of try to shake things up and kind of make it seem like they had more of a story to tell when really they're just really stretching, like, as far as they can. So really, they're just gonna go back and tell us a story we already know with characters they already know we like. Because it's like they're biding their time until they come up with a plot for another movie. <laughs> it's like, well, let's just, let's just scoot this out there. And while they're distracted, we'll think of a new movie. <laughs> and we'll just say, this is part of the series. Yay! Uh, as, long as, we make it, as long as we make it feature a length, maybe they'll buy it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, what really though, um, it is interesting to see them kind of go in this territory. Because we do have... Um, because those are, those are set in present day, and this kind of takes us back to hundreds and hundreds of years ago, where it's like, we get to focus on, like, a period detail, and like I said, it almost gives it, it's like they're trying to give it, like, a Shakespearean quality, more or less, um, with the, the werewolf slave falling in love with the vampire whose father, like, rules all, and it's very... Yeah, um, but once again, though, it always comes back to... This story was basically already told in one scene in a previous movie. So it's just a matter of how much they expand on it and what they can add to it. We get another sex scene. <laughs> Which, as we pointed out, not the best thing in Underworld movies. There's the thing where he's like, he's like hanging off the cliff. I guess it's the orgasm. I don't know. It's weird. It's bizarre. But <laughs> I get the whole, they tried to play with the imagery a little bit and make it kind of look good aesthetically and all that. Um, and there is, there is some stuff in here that they kind of, you know, built, like some of the stuff, there is some cool stuff in here. Like seeing Victor swing around on the chains and the lichens being cut in half and all that. Um, basically, it's it's like watching Rogue One. You're introduced to a brand new hero whose fate you pretty much already know before it even starts. So the question is just how much your investment is going to go into these people. Um, and so, and yeah, these, these battle scenes are okay. Um, it's kind of like, it's like the director kind of studied Lord of the Rings and then used like one one thousandth of the scale of those battle scenes. <laughs> like, just the absolute tiniest fraction of those. Um, and that's pretty much what we have here. 
like I said, for the most part, it feels a little dragged out. There is, um, but there's some cool stuff in there. Um, like, Lucian getting his own movie, I don't think anybody was going to complain. Whether you're a Lucian fan or a Michael Sheen fan in general. It's like, it, it's kind of cool to see an actor like him be like the star of a movie like this. Especially since, I believe this movie was out in theaters during the awards run of Frost Nixon. Cause yeah, I, <laughs> it was. Because that, that was interesting. <laughs> that was an interesting time to be alive and a movie fan. Um, so yeah, but honestly, what I... I mean, they can do whatever they want. But um, honestly, what I probably would have done with this is... yeah, We do get just enough of a taste in the first movie of this story to say... Yeah, I'd kind of like to know what happened beforehand. I'd kind of like to know that story of their forbidden love and the battle between him and Victor and all that. Um, but honestly, what I maybe would have done is, I know this is a weird comparison, but just hear me out. Um, if you took this movie and kind of did like a Godfather 2 thing, where Underworld 3 was half a new movie and half of this, and they kind of paralleled. Like, this movie is only an hour and a half. Like, to be fair, it doesn't drag anything out. Per se. Well, just in general. The whole thing is to drag out the series. But, I mean, as far as a, mo a standalone movie, it is just an hour and a half. But, you know, cut it in half. Maybe take 45 minutes of this movie and kind of put it within... Um, a new underworld telling. Uh, and I feel like you could have had something interesting if you did it Godfather 2 style. <laughs> You'd be able to tell this story that maybe people wanted expanded on while bringing back the characters that were the most interesting ones in the other movie. While telling a different story, one that doesn't have an ending we know, um, and a complete and total outcome that has already been established. Uh, that's maybe what I would have done, but the thing is, is, while it is a decent story, there's really not enough here to kind of completely and totally, you know, warrant, uh, an entire new movie. So, it's, and they, and they didn't really, they didn't really do anything to expand. This movie is everything we knew because of that scene in the first movie. There is... <laughs> So, yeah, like I said, there it's really not bad. Um, like, it's not... Honestly, watch, despite all this, watching it isn't a total waste of time. Um, it's certainly... It helps a lot if you're going to marathon them to watch this first, probably. Would make it feel much less pointless. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but it's... Yeah, just overall, though, it really feels like they were just biding their time until they wrote a new sequel. <laughs> That's just me, I guess, though. So we did. We did eventually get that sequel three years later. Um, with, these movies come out in January for some reason. And they're three years apart, except for the, the latest one. Yeah. It, it should have been. It should have came out last year. Yeah. Just um, stick with the three-year time frame. Oh, God, there's five years between this and Blood Wars. So, yes, now we have Awakening. Awakening, this is the point where I don't remember much about what the reaction to Rise of the Lycans was, mm -mm. but Awakening is where I kind of feel like like people were maybe done with this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> where people were kind of like, yeah, um, we've kind of moved on from Underworld now. There's too many things like it. Um... There was a three-year gap between this and Rise of the Lycans when there was no... Between this and Evolution, there was no continuation of the story. So, I, that may have been where its fan base was kind of like... I was telling you on the way down, I was comparing people... The Underworld's fan base going to Underworld movies kind of being, like, weirdly enough, people that go to church. Right. Like, just strictly out of habit and, you know, loyalty or whatever. We're just like, well, it's Sunday again, gotta go do this, and then we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna go on, and just, that's life. It's like, for Underworld fans, it's like, oh, like, put another one of these out. I'm not overly passionate, but I'll go, because it's another Underworld movie. And they brought 3D into it. It's like, yep, that's an Underworld movie. 
time to go on with life. <laughs> it's, it's like that, I, I believe that's what Underworld's fan base mostly looks like now. <laughs> or it's like, yeah, yeah, we we saw the others. I guess we got to see this one. And there we go. It's not like it's a lot of time. You can tell they're running out of ideas because the movies have been getting progressively shorter. Blood Wars is obscenely short. <laughs> and Awakening was like 88 minutes. Wow. Like, we were under 90 minutes by the time we got to Awakening. <laughs> so, um, obviously, we've come full circle. We got to see Celine, you know, on the building at the end of Rise of the Lycans. Now she's back to tell us her goddamn life story. Because <laughs> that's how every movie starts. Um... Does it's the same? It's the same narration every time. They just add scenes from each new movie, and so it's like this time, like when she's telling her backstory in uh, Evolution, we see all those scenes we saw in the first movie. And then when we're getting the backstory in Rise of the Lycans, we kind of get clips. And now here, it's Celine telling her life story, but now we're seeing clips of the first movie, the second movie. And Rise of the Lycans for some reason. She's telling her life story and we're seeing clips from a movie she wasn't in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess. Um, oh no. Blood Wars continues the tradition. You won't be disappointed, don't you worry. <laughs> but anyway, after we get her whole life story again, they do do something interesting here. And that is um, the time jump. Because this is, like, supposed to be six months after Evolution or something. And so, um, she's, she may or may not have something going on after that weird-ass scene where he fucked her stomach. Uh, he, just, he just put it directly in there. <laughs> That's just what he does. Um, but no, then they get blown up. And we never see Scott Speedman again. <laughs> I'm sure your heart... He's still in there, but it's like, how do we get Scott Speedman out of this movie, guys? Think. 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 Okay. We're gonna blow her into the future. <laughs> um, so she gets knocked out by this explosion, and then she's, like, cryogenically frozen, and then she wakes up, I think it's, like, 12 years later. Um, so she's, like, the bride now. Like, the child apparently came out and is doing just fine. Growing. Um, somewhere in the middle of all this. Um, and that's what you do when you're running out of ideas in a series. We're on number four now. Yep, give the protagonist a child. Because, you know, Superman's got one now. Or did in Superman Returns, so... Why not? Let's just go that route. <laughs> um, so that's what they do. But, since Scott Speedman's no longer in this now... Bring in a new buddy for her to run around with. Yeah. You know, you know, honestly, what I think a big problem with this movie, what this movie series is, is that they build up Celine to be this big hardcore badass. And I buy that, you know, sure. How Beckinsale plays her, the way she's written, the way she's portrayed. Sure, sure, she's a badass hero. Um, how about this? How about a movie where she works alone? That would... Would that not amp up the badassery a little bit? Yeah. No, she's always just dragging around some fucking dude with her. <laughs> no matter what. Even if Scott Speedman gets blown to God knows where, gets blown to out of the script, there's gotta be somebody. So here he comes. Divergent? That's what mm -hmm. he's talking Yeah. <laughs> the guy I always forget exists. Theo James. Ugh. Yep. Before Divergent, he was in this. Something I totally forgot about. <laughs> um, at least he brings Charles Dance into the story, but we'll get there. Um, so, yes. Uh, and now she goes around with him doing action scenes. And the idea is... to She thinks she's looking for... She thinks she's finding Scott Seaman, but she's actually finding her daughter, Eve. I think that's her name. Yep. <laughs> okay, good. Um... And then it basically turns into aliens. Eve is Newt, and we just have to protect her while we're doing all this stuff. Because the thing is, is in this jump in time, um, now the whole world knows about the vampire lycan war. It's no longer this secret underworld thing. We've totally lost the point of our title now. <laughs> um, it is now a common thing. And supposedly, um, lycans are near extinct, and we're almost done with this. But nope. 
this is a franchise. <laughs> we gotta keep them coming. Um, and that's basically um, the most of what's going on here. Um, we do introduce, um, okay, we do go up. We do have an increase in the acting quality here. Um, we have Stephen Ray, who ultimately ends up being our villain. Uh, Michael Ealy is the detective who gets involved. And as I was mentioning, Charles Dance. So, yeah, we're looking a little better as far as who we have in here. So, <laughs> at least there's that. Um... And, yeah, and I do like the, um, I do like the twist about how Stephen Ray and his crew are lichens. That's decent enough. And, um, there's something that was kind of, they're kind of slacking a little bit in the other movies that Awakening kind of, you know, gets to. And that is, um, the action in this one is a little better than it had been in the series before. Um, like the, um, the, the, the scene where the Ligons are chasing them in the van, I think is a pretty decent scene. Um, and I like, I like the way it's shot, too, where there's not a whole lot of editing going on, and it's kind of coasting along with it. It's a scene that seems way too good to be in an Underworld movie. I mean, it's not like a stellar, stellar scene or anything. It's not like the highway scene in Transformers 3 level good, which is, I know it sounds, it feels weird to... <laughs> talk so positively about a Transformers movie, but, I mean, just that scene. Um, and it kind of has to feel that, but much like that scene also, um, the, while the action in this is pretty decent, especially for where we are in the franchise, um, there is some unneeded slow-mo that we could have done without. Um, that maybe hinders what could have been something really cool in some places. Um, and there's some cool gory moments, like when she just, uh, when she flat out just stomps the dude's head and just, like, explodes under her foot, practically. And she just jumps to somewhere else right afterwards. She basically used the remains of the dude's head while crushing it as leverage to jump somewhere. <laughs> um, stuff like that is cool. Um, and it is one of those cases where... It, it's... this Another thing the action scenes have going for it is it doesn't feel as much like that stuff in the other movies I was talking about where it's like the action in the earlier movies feels like it's trying too hard to be cool, you know? Like everything has to be cool. Uh, <laughs> so it's just kind of naturally, they're naturally their own thing. Um, and they're fine. And a lot of the times they're actually driving a scene. Which is something you don't see every day in a movie. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this one is okay. Um, there's, um, there's a scene where we learn, the Superman return scene, <laughs> where we learn exactly what Eve is capable of, and she takes that lichen and, and just kind of, like, rips its head down the middle. Uh, that shit's pretty cool. <laughs> and then there's stuff like, uh, oh yeah, we were talking about the actors in this, um, Wes Bentley. Uh, remember when American Beauty came out? And afterwards, everybody was talking, like, Wes we didn't see Wes Bentley in a lot of stuff, and the word was that he was really picky. Like, he only wanted the top-notch things. Well, in all of 2012, Wes Bentley shows up for 30 seconds to get thrown out of the building and splatter onto a car, like Conan O'Brien in the South Park movie, in an Underworld movie. Get this? He's uncredited. <laughs> so, that's where Wes Bentley is now. I mean, I know he was in Interstellar a couple of years ago, but... <laughs> Still, he was killed 30 seconds after he was introduced in the fourth Underworld movie. So much for being a picky actor. Good job there, Blackheart. So, <laughs> so um... But yeah, this one is fine... Um, there's not a whole lot of expansion. Like I said, the whole expanding on the hero having a child thing feels very played out. Uh, and the whole protecting a child thing in general just reeks of, well, we didn't really know what else to do. Remember, we, we so didn't know what else to do that we made an entire movie in the middle based solely on shit you already knew because of the scene in the first movie. This is the best we could do. <laughs> Um, and on an action standpoint, it's okay. Um, but there is that thing, though, where all these movies kind of set up for a sequel. And it's kind of like, 
this is kind of where it loses me a little bit because it's like it's okay if they're going on they're not hurting anybody by existing um but there is with these constant cliffhangers at the end of each movie it does feel like it shows a bit of an overconfidence in their own relevance that they feel like that they will have a crowd still if they just keep ending on cliffhangers. <laughs> um, so that's kind of... Eh, I don't know. But apparently it pays off enough because they keep getting them. Which finally brings us to today. Which is... Bye. Uh... <laughs> Which brings us to our last movie, which is the new movie for this week. Underworld Blood Wars. Yes. Uh, the fifth installment of this series. <laughs> okay. If you're still hanging on, good for you. You're very loyal. Uh, <laughs> if only you could be repaid. <laughs> um, so, once again, get the same intro. <laughs> The same recap, only instead of having footage of Underworld, Underworld Evolution, and Rise of the Lycans, now we have footage set to the same narration of Underworld, Underworld Evolution, Underworld Rise of the Lycans, and Underworld Awakening. And it's the same shit in every movie. In every single movie we see Victor's head getting sliced in half. <laughs> um, every single movie. But like I said, that Friday the 13th thing, I swear to God it's the same thing. Okay, now we got a new plot, kind of, because we have a new villain, kind of. <laughs> we got a lot of villains in this movie, actually, but our main focus seems to be Marius. That's a name that's going to keep you up at night, isn't it? Ooh, Marius is going to get me. <laughs> <laughs> and what Marius wants to do is um, Eve is missing now. But because Eve is part Scott Speedman, part Celine. She's this new hybrid thing, and her blood could make Marius and his people invincible. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so she has to stop them and find Eve so that she can protect her from them. With the help of, yet again, Theo James. Because Scott Speedman is... Who cares? Uh... <laughs> Um, this is one of those movies where they try to start off the action immediately, but in that same ill-advised way. The opening scene of this movie is like looking directly into a strobe light. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, I think this is supposed to be enticing. Not feeling it, but I get what they're going for. Um, and we're in that same territory. This is one of those movies where the line is, um, she's like... Selene is on the same page as us. I'm sure Kate Beckinsale is as tired of this as we are. So she goes up to him and she's like, I'm finished with this war. And what is the line given to her in return? Well, the war's not finished with you. She should have winked at the camera when she said that line. <laughs> so, um, and we've got, we've got a villain overload here. This is an issue. We've got Marius. We've got, what was her name? Samira, I think. It's something along the lines of that. Um, we've got that girl whose name I didn't catch. I, just, I kept calling her Discount Elizabeth Olsen. <laughs> and then there was that Twilight Reject guy that kept taking his shirt off. Um, a lot of damn villains for a movie that's under an hour and a half. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that's what we get. Um... The the effect once again the effects in these movies kind of go back and forth, usually in the same movie. Like sometimes they're all right and sometimes they're not. Um, and the thing that kind of stands out in these is it seems like with every movie the lichen transformations are getting uh, faster. Like we started like in the first movie we were all like it was almost on the lines of American Werewolf in London, only just really CGI heavy. Um, but by we get by the time we get to Blood Wars, they can just bruh, into them. Uh, it saves time, I guess. But <laughs> it's not like they didn't have time to spare. Um, but the thing is, is that for the most part, um, I guess you can also say this is kind of what the effects look like, too. Um, when we get big action scenes in this movie, like when we get big battles, 
Um, they feel so cluttered. There's so much shit going on. It's it's just like kind of watching that, you know, like when like back in the day when your TV went out and it was just the black and white. Um, that's kind of what the battles look like. And once again, it's an underworld movie, so they're always in the damn dark. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time. Um, but that's only when we can get to battle scenes. That's only when we have forced enough into this movie to get to a battle scene. We've reached a point in the story where we really have to struggle to get to a point to where an action scene is even relevant. Do you know how we do that? Well, we need more people. We need these battles to be bigger. So we need to start tra training people. Training people for battle. So, yep, there is a whole Hunger Games training facility that shows up in this movie. And we have to justify having our action scenes and padding this runtime. And we know there's really nothing of relevance that we can do to add an action scene to where it actually has something to do with fucking anything. So in the middle of the movie, we're just like, well, let's just do... We need to be doing something, so let's do this whole thing. Oh, so you're training these young people, huh? Why don't we get in this cage and show these young people how you really fight? So it's just them fighting to fucking train and more or less entertain the trainees. That's where we're reaching to get action scenes in this movie. It's like the door in Wayne's World 2. <laughs> that was the first one. Yeah, the first one, yeah. Um, so if that's if that's your thing, I mean, every now and then we get something like, um, like there's um, Samira and Charles Dance have a sword fight, and for the twenty seconds that it lasts, it's pretty cool. <laughs> but that's the problem. As soon as it starts, it's fucking over. <laughs> it's like, oh well, we almost had a glimmer of cool there. Okay, thanks, movie, for staying in check. Um, and there's not just, um, it's not just battle sequences either. Like, there's a fight in the middle between, um, Selene and Marius. Where it's just, like, like, every, and, but when it's happening, there's so much shit going on around it. It's like, tr it's like the, it's like everything that the battle between Harry and Voldemort and Deathly Hallows 2 did right. To where that was, the, there was shit going down everywhere, obviously. But the that one particular fight was our main focus and all we gave a shit about at the time. Whenever it was on screen, it didn't matter what was around it. Um, everything in this movie is just all over the place, no matter who's supposed to be important in this story. And it's, it's just too much, I guess. And a villain overload is not helping this at all. Um, so there's that. And just like I was saying... You can tell they're running out because the movies are getting shorter and shorter. They're just really doing everything they can to just drag this franchise out as much as they can. Um, when they can just really... Like, why go through the trouble? I, mean, I don't know anybody that's really damn passionate about these movies or anything. I don't know why studios would be. Um, like, why put all that effort... You're clearly... You're gonna, like... You're going to bust a lot of blood vessels, how hard you're straining, to stretch this series out. It really doesn't need to go... And that's what... You were asking me if they set up for another sequel. Mm. Knowing this series, probably, but given the end shot, it's kind of like... I could see that going either way. That could be a closing shot. That could be a cliffhanger shot. I guess it depends on your interpretation. It does say in the notation here that I'm reading that they're setting up for a sixth movie and also a television series. But there's no, there's no reason. Nope. But there's no, I mean, that's the thing too, is these movies aren't like horrible or anything. The acting can be in some cases, but for the most part, um, it's like you can tell when the actors in them are getting less and less recognizable. It's like when we got that random adrenaline shot of Stephen Ray and Michael Ealy and Charles Dance in Awakening. It was like, where the fuck did they come from? Um, well, yeah, back to this, it's like, there's Kate Beckinsale and Theo James, I guess. A little bit of Charles Dance. Familiar faces, that might be it. Um, but the thing is, is that it's this movie isn't even particularly bad because it's too insignificant. It's too insignificant to be considered particularly, like, really bad or anything. So... 
Yeah. It's just another Underworld movie. They just, they're just going. They're the Energizer Bunny of vampire werewolf movies. <laughs> Fuck, fucking Twilight knew when to end. <laughs> I don't know. And the, and, a, and the whole thing leading up to all this, um, the whole climax, like our, la our big closing point, is almost comic in its abruptness. It's like, it just, it's like we really, it just, so to be fair, I guess it's merciful when it's runtime. Like, they're really, like, they don't try to desperately drag out the, the lengths of the movies themselves. They're just doing it with the series. <laughs> but, so yeah, another Underworld movie's out. This may be the first some of you are knowing. Like my brother, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. There it is. Another Underworld movie. No surprises whatsoever. Well, speaking of the fact that this isn't a typical AJ's movie reviews, because we're obviously reviewing movies prior that I've long since came out, hmm. we can do a star amount for the new movie, so uh, I'm sure everyone wants to know what your opinion star amount for uh, Blood Wars. Two. Okay. Like I said, just really too insignificant to go lower than that. It's just there. <clears throat> it's just there. It's just another Underworld movie, so yeah. I mean, once again, though, <clears throat> if that's your thing, if that's what you keep going back for, there it is. That's what you want, I guess. Right. Okay, so there it is. So that is your review video for today. Tomorrow, AJ's Movie Reviews will continue, and we're going to go back to 2016 hmm. for uh, Manchester by the Sea, Hidden Figures, and the Monster Calls. And yes, I can officially confirm 100% without a question Next week, next Friday, La La Land, Lion, and Patriot's Day. Hopefully, Everything else, we'll see what hopefully happens. Hopefully more. We'll hopefully see what Hopefully live by night. Silence. Silence. Pray for a miracle. <laughs> and the 2017 releases of a Monster Trucks and the Bye Bye Man. And Sleepless. And also Sleepless. So. And Sunday, that's the Golden Globes. So if you haven't yet checked it out, uh, check out our Golden Globes prediction video, which is available right here on this network, and also our two-part series for our Academy Awards predictions. So, That being said, uh, follow along with Podcast Network on Twitter, on Zazzle, on our uh, Facebook fan page, and also on Patreon, all under Podcast Network, very simple. So that being said, I want to thank you guys and girls out there for watching. AJ, mm -hmm. any parting words? That's it. <laughs> <laughs>